Good morning. We'd like to call the Pension Health Benefits Committee to order. The first order of business will be to call the roll. Rob Fechner. Good morning. Ramon Rubelkavia. Good morning. Here. Margaret Brown. Here. Henry Jones. Here. David Miller. Here. Arena Ortega. Here. Mona Pascal Rogers. Here. Teresa Taylor. Here. Karen Green Ross for Betty Yee. Here. Thank you. And you please note for the record that uh, Mr. Perez, uh, Ms. Hollinger, and Mr. Slayton have joined the committee this morning. Item two is the approval of the 2006 or the April 16th Pension Health Committee timed agenda. Second. Moved by Taylor, seconded by Miller. Any discussion on the motion? Seeing none, all in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed, no. Motion carries. Item three, executive report. Ms. Bailey Kremens, Ms. Lum, please. Good morning, Mr. Chair, members of the committee, Donna Lum, CalPERS team member. I have one very brief update to share with you this morning, and it's related to the CalPERS Benefit Education event that we held in Eureka on March 22nd and 23rd. If you recall last month, I mentioned that this is one of our most remote Northern California locations as the nearest regional office is here in Sacramento, and it's about a five to five and a half hour drive. I'm happy to share with you that, once again, we have broken another record for attendance at a CB. Our prior record in Eureka was about 426 attendees, and at this uh, CB, we had nearly 600. Wow. So, again, Excellent. being that far north, um, our members really, really do appreciate when we host events like this, and they really do come in force to get the information that they need. Um, we did notice that in the working sessions that we had um, that these members were very engaged. They asked a lot of really good questions, and they also took a lot of time to visit the exhibit halls and to interact with our team members and the exhibitors that we have there as well. So again, I just wanted to share with you that that was a very successful event. Um, and then just one very fun highlight uh, that the team members had, and they had a great sense of pride when this took place. We had a member um, who had had about 30 years of 37 years of service uh, and he had a lot of questions about planning for retirement our team members actually helped him to establish a my calpers account while he was at the event he happened to be there with his wife um, they assisted him with running a retirement estimate they answered questions about beneficiary designations and power of attorneys and other really relevant information that our members need when they're making an important decision like retirement. And by the end of the day, he had made his decision along with his wife to retire, and they went on to assist him with his retirement application. So this is just, again, an example of how our members truly do benefit from the resources that we put into these events. And in the case of Eureka being, again, as far north as they are, they really did appreciate our presence. Um, so as a reminder um, to our members, those watching the webcast and the audience here, we do have our entire CB schedule they, uh, posted on CalPERS online. And so again, we encourage you to look at the schedule and if you're in a location near one of the CBs within a reasonable traveling distance, we do encourage you to attend. There's a lot of information that you can gain. And um, these CBs are also targeted for members that are in their mid to early career, as well as those that are nearing retirement. There's a lot of information that can be gleaned out of these sessions to help plan for retirement. So, Mr. Chair, that concludes my presentation, and I'm available to answer any questions. Thank you. I just want to comment that I was contacted here in this last month by a member who was in the hospital, been in the hospital for 30 days, and didn't look like they were going to get out anytime soon. Uh, so through communications, your staff was able to go from San Jose to the hospital in Santa Cruz to retire that person. And I just want to say what a, what a great service that was. Uh, the person has now passed away. But uh, the service was done, and his wife was taken care of. So thank you and your staff. Thank you, and I'll, go, I'll share that information Please with do. the team. Ms. Bailey Crimmins. Good morning, Mr. Chair and members of the committee. Leanna Bailey Crimmins, CalPERS team member. On our agenda today, we have three action items before you. The first two are proposed revisions to the Public Employees Medical and Hospital Care Act, also known as PEMCA. The first proposal would allow CalPERS to grant members an additional 30 days to request a CalPERS administrative review on an appeal. Currently, PEMCA only allows these extension requests for an administrative hearing, and we believe having an additional 30 days for the review process will be a benefit to our members. 
The second proposal addresses technical changes to bring the regulation into alignment with current law, such as ACA, and remove outdated terms and references to statutes that no longer exist. The third action is a relation to a benefit enhancement for the CalPERS long-term health care program. This new offering would be a fall prevention program. It's called Lift Wellness, and it would be um, available to long-term care members over the age of 75. This is a national program designed by experts to help reduce the risk of falls and fractures so our long-term care members may remain independent in their homes for as long as possible. And finally, we have good news to share with you in relation to the CalPERS efforts in managing opioids on behalf of our members. As a reminder, at the last July offsite, we gave you highlights on our successes at, with, with Kaiser. Well, today you're going to hear our successes with our pharmacy benefit manager, OptumRx. So, Mr. Chair, that concludes my opening remarks, and I'm available for any questions. Very good, thank you. Seeing none, brings us to agenda item four. The action consent items, having had no request to remove anything, what's the pleasure of the committee? Move Moved by Jones, seconded by Taylor. Uh, any discussion on the motion? Seeing none, all in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed, no. Motion carries. Item five, the information consent items, having no request to uh, move anything, brings us to agenda item six, uh, starting with the uh, action items. We have 6A, proposed revisions to the PEMCA rules. Uh, Ms. Donison. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Members of the committee, Kathy Donison, CalPERS team member. Agenda item 6A is a proposal to uh, make some technical revisions to the Public Employees Medical and Health Care Act, or PEMCA. This agenda item is an action item in which we will recommend te these technical changes that will enhance support of our PO's program for our members. The technical change we request is meant to align two sections of One Government Code 599.51a. In the A section of the Government Code, that is the administrative review portion of a member's right to appeal. And within that 30 days, they can come to us after a determination has been made uh, to request um, an administrative review. If they go beyond 30 days in that request, um, we technically do not have the approval to grant any type of additional time. But Section E of the same government code states that they may request an administrative hearing uh, within writing within 30 days of the administrative review decision. So in one hand, we have a 30-day under A for them to file the appeal, but not the ability to grant any extending time but in E, in order to go to the next step, request an administrative hearing, we do have the opportunity under the government code to allow an exception process for more time. So in summary, this agenda item aligns those two sections so that our members, if they have complicated cases or they miss their filing under A for review, they have an additional amount of time to uh, meet that review process and then move on and, uh, to the administrative hearing should they wish to do so. That's the essence of the technical change and we do request approval. Are there any questions? Thank you. Ms. Brown. Uh, thank you, Ms. Donison. Um, did this um, change come about as a result of sort of audit findings that said that we were extending some or we weren't following the Section A? Is that, is that correct? Yes, ma'am. It did come as a technical finding within an audit, and we did look at the alignment and want to make sure that one, we're meeting our requirements to clear the audit as well as give our members more time to follow the full process. I, I think that's excellent that we are going to allow them an additional 30-day extension. My concern is if we have any denials in the past where they didn't ap appeal within 30 days or they didn't uh, they, fo they didn't follow, or they followed 
followed A exactly and we denied them because they came in at 35 or 40 days. Now, I know the audit said you were allowing those appeals, even yes. though they were beyond the 30 days. So I just want to make sure there isn't anybody that we denied because they were at 40 days or 50 days. But they'll get a chance maybe to come back. I don't I just. Um, I, uh, I believe that if there were, they're small. But I do have my uh, appeals manager here, and perhaps she could could address. Would I that just hope we would apply it maybe retroactively if it's not a big Let's group. go back. <laughs> this is April Fernstrom. She's the manager of the appeals process. Microphone. On the other side. There we go. Hi, good morning, everyone. Thank you for your question. Um, so in the past, we were considering extenuating circumstances for members who came to us outside of the 30-day um, time frame. So we could certainly take a look back at our previous appeals that were received out of that time frame and review how we made our determination. Um, but because of the audit, that was one of the things that came to light, is that we were accepting them in cases showing good cause. I really appreciate that you were giving members benefit of the doubt and that we're going to align our regulations in PEMCA. I would just hope that we would retroactively just go back and look and maybe just let us know. Um, it wouldn't need to be a presentation, but just let us know if there's anyone else that we could take a look at. We want to try and help our members where, and I know that's why we got in trouble, so, but thank you. We agree, yes. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. So you know the requests to speak. What's the pleasure of the committee? Move the staff so moved by Rubacaba, second, seconded by Miller. Uh, no discussion, any discussion on the motion? Seeing none, all in favor say aye. 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 Opposed, no. Motion carries. Brings us to agenda item 6B, the uh, revisions to uh, the PEMPCA and various technical revisions. Ms. Little. Yeah. No, Mr. Drozombeck. So what happens when you list more than one name? Hi, good morning, committee chair, committee members. Rob Drazonbeck, helpers, team member. I'm presenting agenda item 6B, which is an action item, requesting your approval to pursue technical and non-substantive changes to regulations affecting the CalPERS Health Benefits Program. These changes have been identified as outdated for a variety of reasons, and they fall into three basic categories. The first category is revisions. We're proposing changes or revisions to subsections that are outdated. The second category is removals. We recommend removing or eliminating sections and references that are no longer applicable. And the last category is relettering. So based on removing some sections, subsequent sections need to simply be relettered. So for the first category, the sections we propose revising, here are a couple of examples of what they contain. Subdivision B of section 599.501 contains outdated terminology that is no longer used to describe individuals with a disability. The term handicapped is no longer used when describing a person who is either blind, deaf, or disabled. In subdivision G of that same section, we propose to update the timeline to submit recertification documents for disabled dependents. This change will make the recertification process, the recertification timeframe consistent with those for submitting documents for parent-child relationships, as well as dependent eligibility verification. So this change will reduce complexity in our program by using a standard timeframe for all recertification processes. As far as the second category, removing sections, we propose to delete a subdivision that gives the appearance that certain annuitants are ineligible for CalPERS health benefits. For example, subdivision C of 599.501 states that a retiree whose monthly retirement allowance is insufficient to pay the premium of the lowest cost health plan is ineligible for CalPERS health benefits. This provision was removed with the development of the Complementary Annuitant Premium Program, or the CAP program. The CAP program allows retired members to continue their health coverage by paying CalPERS the balance of the premium owed, regardless of which health plan <coughs> they choose. Similarly, we propose to delete inaccurate information in subdivision E of this same section, as it too gives the appearance that certain annuitants are ineligible for CalPERS health benefits. 
This regulation reflects that members who are not enrolled in a CalPERS health plan at the time of separation from employment are not eligible for CalPERS health benefits in retirement. However, other provisions within PIMCA specify that an annuitant, an annuitant may enroll during any future open enrollment period, thus contradicting the subdivision. We propose deleting this language. And finally, the third category, relettering. Uh, we propose to reletter um, Reletter sections impacted by the removal of code sections and update various cross references found throughout the regulations. The majority of the changes we're actually pursuing fall into this category. There are numerous benefits to pursuing these changes. These changes will allow CalPERS to better maintain accuracy in our regulations. It'll minimize confusion amongst members, employers, as well as CalPERS team members. It addresses an observation made last year through an internal audit and it eliminates outdated statutory requirements. If the committee approves these changes, we'll submit our public notice package to the Office of Administrative Law and proceed with a 45-day comment period. At this time, we do not anticipate any comments. At the end of the comment period, we'll return to the committee and re request approval of the final rulemaking file. This concludes my presentation, and I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you, Ms. Brown. Uh, mine are pretty simple. Um, <clears throat> on the regulation that says an annuitant uh, may enroll if not enrolled, can you tell me what that regulation section is? Yep. Oh, it's not that easy. Okay. Um, off the top of my head, it is may enroll for not. It's five nine nine five zero one subdivision E. Five nine nine five zero one subdivision E. Yes. Okay. And are we? Is the change that they may enroll? If they're currently not enrolled at any open enrollment time? Yes. And they that can, is the change, so they may. They may, and they also may enroll during any qualifying event. Like marriage. Correct. Birth. Correct. So it's, it's clarifying this one that said they aren't um, and falls in line with the rest that say that they are and has been our practice. Great. Thank you. Thank you. I have, uh, let's see, anybody else on the board? Mr. Jones. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Move approval. Second. All right. It's been moved by Jones, seconded by Brown. Mr. Rubacaba. Uh, I had a question, but it might not. I don't want to delay the enactment of well, ask, ask your question. Just please. want to make sure. Um, one kind of, in general, in totality, all these are good changes for the members, and I support them, of course. But just want a little history on um, on 599.0502 subdivision C. It seems to ask, like, for. Um, permission from the carrier for, is it like, is it outdated pre-existing conditions? Is that what that is? Yes. So this is a, <laughs> that's this is illegal now anyway. <laughs> correct. And it changed with um, HIPAA coming to an, going into effect in 1998 and then also with the ACA. So yeah. this is, again, this is just clean up, um, like cleaning up the regulations so they reflect all the current law. No, I, I understand it's clean up. I just want to make sure people understand that this is definitely uh, advantageous for the members. Yes. Very good. And I support Mr. Jones, uh, President Jones' uh, motion. Thank you. <laughs> See no other requests from the board. We do have one request from the audience, J.J. Jelinczyk. Please come down to uh, my left. You'll have up to three minutes. Please state your name for the record. I'm Joseph John Jelensic, Jr., um, better known as JJ. The presentation of this regulation, cutting out sections, saves a lot of trees, and I understand why it was done. However, one of the problems that gets missed when you do that is currently 559501A refers to both B and C, and this proposal is to eliminate C and renumber it so it's now a different C. And so I would encourage you to fix that before it went to the uh, Office of Administrative Law. Thank you. Mr. Dronsbeck, any uh, comment? I believe we were going to update that, but I'll take that back to ensure that's included. Very good. Thank you. So you know the request. Motion being before you. All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed, no. Motion carries. Thank, Thank you. you. 6C, long-term care benefits update. Ms. Donison.
Mr. Chair, members of the committee, this is another action item the team is bringing forward. Uh, this in agenda item discusses a long-term care benefit change designed to reduce claims associated with falls, gait anomalies, and imbalance for our members in the long-term care program. Uh, Courtney J. Nakayama, whom we also call CJ, will make this presentation and then will be available to answer your questions. Upon conclusion, we would like to ask you to approve this agenda item. CJ? Mr. Chair, members of the committee, CJ Nakayama, CalPERS team member with the Health Plan Administration Division. Today I'll be presenting, as Kathy said, uh, agenda item 6C, an action item for long-term care benefit updates. At the conclusion, we'll ask that you approve our team's recommendation. This item aligns with CalPERS strategic plan goal of health plan affordability. And today I will cover the Lift Wellness Program, why there is a focus on falls, goals and components of the program, and lastly, next steps. The Lift Wellness Program is a proactive pre-claim intervention program that's focused on one of the major causes of long-term care claims, falls and fractures. It is designed to prevent falls, keep participants functioning independently, and lower long-term care claims. The program was originally developed in 2004 in a collaboration between the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services and our third-party administrator, LTCG. Program development was guided by an appointed technical advisory group comprised of fall prevention experts based on extensive literature review and founded upon best practices. It's an evidence-based program and in the original pilot produced an 18% reduction in injurious falls, a 33% reduction in long-term care claims over a three-year period, and participants in the program were 20% more likely to make fall-preventing home modifications than those who did not participate. So why focus on falls? As we age, we are more susceptible to falls, gait anomalies, and imbalance. This is especially true for those over the age of 75. In this chart, you can see the, total, uh, the cumulative total claims that were open at the end of each calendar year. And in fact, from program inception through December 31st of 2017, Claims due to falls, gait anomalies, and imbalance comprise 21% of CalPERS total paid long-term care claims. This amounted to over $490 million. So the goals of the program are really simple. They're to prevent falls, promote wellness, reduce health and long-term care costs, and help, help keep participants living independently and in their home for longer. The program consists of multiple components, consisting of member engagement. This would be done through mail as well as by phone. Once somebody enrolls in the program, they would receive an in-home assessment. From this in-home assessment, an individualized plan is created for the participant, and it's shared with them as well as their physician. And when they receive this plan, they get a lift wellness toolkit that includes a pedometer, a nightlight, magnifying glass, water <clears throat> bottle, literature about, to educate the participant about the risk of falling, exercises to improve balance, and tips to remain safe and living in one's home. This is all followed by 12 months of support and ongoing telephonic coaching. In this, in this chart, we see four different scenarios based on different enrollment rates. If we focus on the 20% enrollment rate, the cost would be approximately $5 million, and the estimated net savings between six and $12.7 million. This would produce a return on investment from 120 to over 200%. But in the end, it really isn't just about the numbers, but about being able to help our long-term care participants to remain safe and functionally independent in their home. 
So if approved, the next steps would be to finalize the program charter and begin communication and outreach. This outreach would be to those 75 years of age and older who've had a long-term care policy for at least seven years, are not in claim, and reside in California. There are over 45,000 CalPERS long-term care participants that would be eligible for this program, and they would be phased in over a three-year period based on enrollment rates and operational limitations. Once someone is enrolled and receives an in-home assessment, a lift care advisory fee would be billed directly to the program. The member would not receive a bill. Throughout the program, we will continue to monitor it through a variety of monthly and quarterly reports, and upon completion, we would do a comprehensive assessment. At this time, I recommend approval of the Lift Wellness Program. This completes my presentation, and I'm available for questions. Thank you. Ms. Brown. Um, thank you. Can you tell me why only in California a lot of our members uh, in the long-term care program reside uh, outside of California? I found this out um, personally last week. I visited uh, two RPEA um, uh, chapters um, in the Albuquerque and Los Alamos, and I will tell you, I had so many questions about long-term care. I'm going to need uh, some education about that because their primary concern was that some of these are our most senior members, and um, they entered the long-term care program when they had to choose between assisted living or in-home, and they have real concerns about the grandfathering, so I want to get an education about that. But also, we do have a lot of members outside of California, so is there a reason why we can't offer it to them as well? Um, the way the program was proposed by the third party administrator for operational reasons is with the bulk of the people being here and having to have nurses physically go to a to the participant's house to do an in-home assessment. Operationally, at least at this period of it, it wouldn't be as cost effective to try to spread it nationwide, but to focus on where our primary uh, concentration of long-term care participants are. And while you look at it, this is for the long-term care participants. So we have, we, while we do have quite a few that live out of state, primarily they live within California. Maybe we could look at the data and see if we could, if we know that we need to have, let's say, 20 participants within a 20 mile radius, if we could gather, get that many people, maybe we could offer it to them. Just take a look at the data, the analysis to see. And maybe we started in California and looked. Okay, go ahead, Kathy. I think you're gonna tell me about, I love data. <laughs> I, was, I was about to agree with you. Yes, we should start it in California. It's voluntary. We need to see what the uptake is. And so we concentrate for efficiency purposes where we start it, which is here, but it doesn't mean it has to stay here that it could be looked upon beyond the California borders. Great, and I know we're looking at cost effectiveness, but also maybe even if we go out state, maybe break break even, right? Uh, so that way, or even if it costs us a little, it might be helpful to have. I know the, they're concerned about falling. I mean, they really are concerned about injuring themselves and they want to stay in their homes. So the more we can offer cost effectively, the better. So I appreciate you continue to look at that. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Miller. Yeah, yeah, thank you for this. Um, um, I have a, a few comments and a, and a question or two. Um, I'm, I'm very, very engaged with the long-term care community. Uh, and the, I think you emphasized, and I can't understate, the, the importance of preventing falls, uh, both in the home but also in institutional settings, and not only because of the, the impact of falls, no pun intended, on, on the person falling, but they're also a huge contributor to injuries, lost time, disability, et cetera, for health care workers and family members and everyone, both at home and institutional. Uh, uh, falls are a huge, huge problem, and, and I applaud you for recognizing that and looking for what we can do. Um, uh, the, in the industry, there's also a couple 
kind of real, there's a lot of potential for technological disruption, both active and passive technologies for addressing falls, potential for falls, um, identifying who is more at risk than who, and kind of tracking the change over, the, over time as partly as a way to engage patients, potential patients, but partly as a way to focus resources. And so I, I hope as, as this develops, certainly in the industry, that, that we're really looking at those trends of new approaches to the whole subject of falls. Uh, for the last 50 years or so, much of it was just focused on as behavioral and you know lift machines and belts and all those type of things but it's much more moving into to high tech and so th that leads to my question which is in looking at this was this just something that uh, a potential provider came to us did we reach out did, were there alternatives that we looked at and put this one forward um, just kind of curious about the process by which this this came to us and, and I am very supportive of it yeah our, our third party administrator LTCG had recently acquired life plans Inc who helped develop this program who was initially part of long-term care group but then split apart um, part way when they were bought by Univita. But they had developed this program back in 2004 and ran a pilot from 2008 to 2012. Um, during one of our quarterly uh, business reviews where we talk about you know industry standards and things moving forward, they brought this program um, in front of us. And the numbers, what it focused on, and helping our participants to remain functionally independent, focusing, like you said, on one of the major causes, falls and fractures. Um, we thought it was a great program, something that would benefit not only our members, but our long-term care program as well. And that's how it came about. Thank you. Ms. Green-Ross. Um, this sounds like a very helpful program for reducing the claims, the cost of claims. Um, just um, want to make sure that it's voluntary only and that there's never going to be any penalty for members who were reached out to participate in California that they would ever be denied claims because they didn't participate. No, this is a 100% voluntary program. There's no penalty. Um, even if somebody enrolls in the program, there's no cost to them either. So no, there's no adverse um, action if somebody does not choose to participate. Only the benefits of getting the education and the ongoing support if they choose to. Have you, hope you have that in good legal writing. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. So you know the request. I do have one request from the audience, Tim Barons. Uh, please come forward. You have up to three minutes. Good morning, Chairman Fechter and uh, committee. Uh, Tim Barons, uh, President of California State Retirees. Uh, I applaud this, this plan. I think it's a great plan. Uh, I would like to see some consideration given in the future to provide the same type of training to all of our stakeholders because loss of balance and falling are inevitable for us as we get older. And I think this really has a lot of merit. CalPERS has always kind of led uh, uh, in preventative medicine, led for preventative plans. Uh, you provided the Silver Sneakers program to all of our stakeholders. I'd like to see some consideration in the future in making the same kind of training available to all of our stakeholders. Thank you. Thank you. So you know the request to speak, the uh, motion being before you. No, there's no. Moved by. Taylor, seconded by Pascal Rogers. Any discussion on the motion? Seeing none, all in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed, no. Motion carries. Thank you. Brings us to 7A, the opioid management update. Ms. Donison. Uh, Mr. Chair and members of the committee, Kathy Donison, CalPERS team member. Um, Mr. Todd Shinohara, who's to my left, will make the presentation, but I would like to give some opening remarks before I give it, turn it to uh, Todd. This agenda item provides an update for how OptumRx is aligning our PPO and HMO pharmacy management with the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention Guidelines. 
At the July offsite in 2018, I made a presentation to, to uh, the full board on what our program has historically done to identify use, prescribing, and cost associated with opioids for CalPERS. The data we presented at the time at that offsite was for the full, our, our full membership, even though I, I co-presented with Kaiser, who also runs the same type of opioid management program, as does Blue Shield. So I just want to make sure that this is about our OptumRx program, but we align all of our uh, opioid management under, under a single CalPERS umbrella. Today we look at the Optum program, which manages the pharmacy benefit for approximately 500,000 basic and Medicare members. And as I, as I said, Todd Shinohara, who is a new pharmacist with CalPERS, having joined us about six months ago, uh, is going to make this presentation and then we will answer questions for you. Todd? Good morning, Mr. Chair and members of the committee. Todd Shinohara, CalPERS team member. This agenda item is an update on how CalPERS and OptumRx are managing opioids for our members. So first, our philosophy is focused on stopping opioid abuse before it starts. At the same time, supporting members and their family members who may be battling dependency issues as well as in recovery. The focus is really towards safety and prevention through engagement, pr smart prescribing, and ongoing monitoring. Finally, the Opioid Risk Management Program by OptumRx aligns with CalPERS strategic measures in the Smart Care of California initiative. Before I go on, I want to point out that OptumRx was recently recognized with the Excellence Award for Opioid Management Strategies at the 2019 Pharmacy Benefit Management Institute National Convention in Palm Springs. Optum received the award where 96% of opioid prescriptions written by prescribers were found to be aligned with CDC best practice for duration and dosage compared to the national average of 55%. So kudos and congratulations to OptumRx. We educate members, prescribers, and pharmacies using multiple channels and touch points. And through education, what we've seen is a reduction in opioid claims and patients by 19% and 15%. We believe by educating and empowering, we're driving to create a more educated prescriber, highlighting safer alternatives, and more prudent prescribing of opioid medications as measured in six months in 2017 compared to 2018 for our basic plans. <clears throat> One of CalPERS strategic measures is to reduce the overuse of ineffective or unnecessary medical care. Through education, the average morphine milligram equivalent utilization per day decreased by 14%. And, the, and we also saw a 32% decrease in adults with a very large dose of greater than 15 day supply and greater than 120 milligram uh, equivalent per day. This is really significant because the higher dose equals the higher risk. We attribute these results to education on appropriate use and duration for opioids. And allow me to point out um, before I move off this slide that the MME is really a conversion tool that equates many different types of opioids into really one standard value. And that standard value is morphine and its potency is referred to as MME or, or morphine milligram equivalent. So for example, hydrocodone is equivalent to morphine uh, at a one-to-one. -one. So 120 milligrams of hydrocodone is equal to 120 milligrams of morphine or 120 morphine milligram equivalents. If you allow me to put my pharmacist hat on, if you're looking at uh, hydrocodone at five milligrams, that equals approximately 24 tablets. But it also means if you're looking at hydrocodone at 10 milligrams, you're looking at 12 tablets. So it's not necessarily the number of tabs, but it's the uh, total morphine milligram equivalent per day that we should be looking at, in which we, we are. Okay? Um, so next, the risk of opioid addiction increases with each additional day of opioids starting after the third day. So it's critical that our physicians and other prescribers for, focus in on this morphine milligram equivalence, dose and duration at the very first prescription. 
So at the heart of the program, minimizing early exposure to opioids reduces inappropriate supplies, which are two of the CDC recommendations in terms of reducing opioid dependence and opioid burden. So some of the highlights I wanna share first include the first point, the number of new patients with greater than 50 MMEs per day. Well, that decreased, uh, those number of prescriptions decreased by 86% and not 18% as listed on the slide here. So let me step back and put that in perspective. Uh, what that means is the normal dose is normally less than 50 morphine milligrams uh, equivalents per day. And we know based on evidence that the risk of overdose, uh, overdose increases twofold when you're at or above 50 MMEs per day. So 86% is a, is a good number. Second, the number of new patients with greater than a seven day supply decreased by 73%. So that decreases the um, supply um, that could be potentially inappropriate. And third, the total opioid use greater than 90 MME per day decreased by 48%. 90 MME per day is, is a high dose. So as you know, the higher the dose, that higher the risk. So again, minimizing early exposure and reducing inappropriate supplies are at the heart of the program, as well as the emphasis toward that patient-physician relationship. Recognizing the high rate of relapse with opioid abuse, our focus further helps build more and effective sustainable recovery by aggressively promoting practice guidelines and interventions. Our members, Physicians and other prescribers are provided unrestricted access to drugs like methadone, naloxone, buprenorphine, which are used to wean patients from op opioids and avoid overdose and relapse. D these drugs, in combination with counseling and behavioral therapies, provide a whole patient approach <coughs> to treatment of substance abuse disorder. So looking at our first year results indicate that our members and prescribers have been appropriately taken advantage of these very important programs. Safety initiatives. Two recent safety initiatives have been really uh, implemented to educate members and to reduce the inappropriate supply of opioids at the home. First, Optum RX Home Delivery Pharmacy is using a warning label located on the underside of the vial cap. And this is in addition to all the warning labels that are seen on the outside of the vial. And second, to dispose of unused or outdated prescription medications, OptumRx is providing a medication disposal option, the Deterra kit. The kit contains really water-soluble pods containing activated carbon, a three-step process that includes placing the drugs into the, the pouch, adding warm water, Closing the pouch renders the um, medication that you put in there uh, unretrievable and inert, and it doesn't harm the environment. And finally, future enhancements or next steps that we're looking at really include follow-up on rejected claims, uh, such as methadone, naloxone, buprenorphine that we discussed earlier. Secondly, identify members who are at high risk for misuse, Enhance point of sale capabilities by integrating data from medical and pharmacy to identify additional safety concerns at that point of sale. And finally, further notification of, to our prescribers um, and education. So the future enhancements for opioids being explored focus on prevention, education, and safety for prescribers, members, and their extended families with prescriptions or access to opioids. So that concludes my presentation, Mr. Chair, and I'll be happy to take any questions. Thank you. First of all, very impressive numbers, so thank you for the presentation. And I will say that at this year's Employers Forum in the vendor room, they were actually handing out those Deterra kits. Uh, so that was a good way to bring that out into the community and educate our members when they attended. Uh, Ms. Taylor. Yes, thank you. Thank you very much for your uh, presentation. They are very impressive numbers. I just, I'm trying to find the page I was looking at. Mm -hmm. um, I just had a couple of questions. Okay. Um, on page four. So uh, new users, uh, 50 MME per day is decreased by 18%, but you were talking about 86 percent 
this is a misprint on the slide. Oh, 86%. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, so let me write that down. So I guess new users, would that be somebody who's just come out of surgery? Uh, is new that what you mean by new, that? New users are generally those persons who are opioid naive. I'm sorry. Opioid, who haven't used opioids before in the past. Ever used opioids right, so this before. this is their first, so it first would, it, For whatever reason, they were prescribed, and we're, we're with, through this program, we're working to get them down, well, to introduce them to less than 50 milligrams as opposed to, I assume, that used to be different, that they used to introduce new patients to a higher, higher milligram? So uh, generally the, um, the normal dosing uh, per, uh, for opioids are generally range between 20 MME per day to 50. Um, and then anything above 50 has that increased higher risk. So uh, the, the focus is toward really lower duration and lower doses. Um, so when I went to pharmacy school at the time, you know, there was many standard doses that you just remember, and maybe many of you have seen one to two milligrams, or one to two tablets every four to six hours as needed for pain, you know, and they give you number 30 as a standard. Some people I knew even had a stamp that went that way. So now it's a more of how much opioids do you really need for that short duration of time. Okay, for, and for whatever reason they're introduced to it. Yes. And then new users always, so I ran into this, I have some members that uh, complained to me, seven day supply. As, uh, so say you come out of surgery, and, and that is apparently what the new, uh, everybody I've talked to that have, have come to me said they, they initially get a seven day prescription, and then they have to go back and ask for more, depending on you know the type of surgery and how much pain they're in. Um, so I, I'm not, I'm sure this is effective. Um, <coughs> it seemed like people were complaining that they not only had to get their doctor to, to do that, but then they had to get the insurance carrier to approve it for surgeries as complex as bariatric surgery, surgery which is painful, knee and hip surgeries, I've heard from folks. So um, I, I, I'm not clear on the benefit of just seven days, and rather than having the doctor, I mean, prescribe uh, the, what they feel is an appropriate range. So, uh, what, what's the what is what are you trying to accomplish by just a seven day after a surgery or something like? That? I get like if you're getting a tooth removed, totally get that, but. <laughs> Seven days, uh, it, it really getting below seven days is really should be the goal. And then when you have complex surgeries that go beyond seven days, then you know that that really dawns upon the experience of that provider with that patient. But that's not what they're running into. They're running into because of this program. I probably uh -huh. they're running because these are my employees, right? State okay. workers. So they're running into being told, okay, well, hold on. So they've already run out. Hold on, we gotta get uh, permission from the insurance carrier. So here they are, seven days out of a bariatric surgery, knee surgery, whatever, and these are uh, having to wait a couple of days in a lot of pain to get approval um, and, and feeling kind of helpless, et cetera. So I, I get the goal for minor pain incidents. I'm, I'm a little concerned that we're kind of throwing the baby out with the ba bathwater from what I'm hearing from my members. So. Okay. So as you, this committee, and for the new members know, we've been working on looking at opioids since the mid 2000s. Right. And we do have concern that's, that what was a very generous prescribing program may have gone to the other extreme the other extreme and so one of a couple of things that we want as a calpers team to continue to look at first of all is there proper pain management and that really is between the patient and the physician uh, i would not like to say that our program was denying anything over seven days but if that were the case we have an appeals and grievance program we would certainly look at that we would also look at um, uh, 
you know, case management programs, which is part of appeals and grievances, but also we're bringing in two, a, a chief medical officer in May, as well as a second medical consultant, and really, this, this is between the patient and their physicians, and the physicians themselves are um, having to deal with these new CDC guidelines and sure. what is appropriate prescribing. What is real pain management for, um, for cancer, for end of life, for chronic pain that may have a source that only the physician really realizes what it is? So we have to be, I think, diligent to know about these things, to keep an eye on any legislation that could be coming through that um, may have an unintended consequences for the prescribers. These are controlled substances, they're called Schedule II, and mm -hmm. therefore it's, it's always been controlled, but we just want to make sure over time, as we bring in our physicians, as we work with healthcare services and covered California uh, over, under Smart Care California, as we, uh, the California Healthcare Foundation is also looking at this. So we just are going to have to we hear about these things, use our appeals and grievances, use our ability to, for case management with our plans, and follow legislation that may have unintended consequences. Right, and I appreciate that. And I think that you and I are kind of saying the same thing, that we don't want to have our patients or our members coming out of surgery and have, my main thing is I don't, I think what I'm hearing is not necessarily that the, the insurance carrier is denying it, but that the, it's taking time. And if they don't know ahead of time, which a lot of our folks don't, that you, okay, you got seven days worth, and if their doctor doesn't tell them, and you just came out of whatever surgery, and you know you've got a three month or six week recovery in pain, they don't know that they would have to, ahead of time, order, ask their doctor to get this approved, so then they're running out of the pain medication, and I think that's what we're running into there. And then you you address my other concern, which is long-term chronic pain that people are in, whether it's cancer or whether it's just chronic pain due to whatever else they, they have, that we seem to want to get everybody off opioids, but then what do you do with these people that are in long-term chronic pain? And Leanna and I have talked about back pain, and, and, and it's real and doesn't go away, and it gets worse as you get older. But um, I, I think that we need to be cognizant of that, and I understand that, led, I would hope that you know our doctors are the ones that get to make these calls and not legislators or insurance companies, and that's where I'm running into some concerns with this. Ms. Taylor, I um, completely agree, and I, what we can commit to is, one, looking at the data. I don't want to wait for a member to have to appeal and wait for it. So we can dive in to see if we're seeing that on our side as well, because we have the data that's available to us. Also, education. Um, there's more that if we could be doing that to make sure that members are um, knowing what they have at the time of, the, of getting the prescription, um, and then working with their, as, as you heard from um, Dr. Donison, making sure that they work with their doctors. If they think that that's going to be seven, maybe 10, 15 days, that they're not sitting on that seventh day and now without any medication. Because at the end of the day, we want to make sure our members have the medication that they need. So we can commit to you of looking at the data, see if we're seeing that on our side, and also making sure that we can enhance uh, communication education through OptumRx and our providers. And I do appreciate, and I really appreciate the fact that we've re reduced um, the overuse and misuse of o opioids. I just, I think it's time for us to look at the other side because no matter what we do as human beings, it seems like we either go one way or the other <laughs> too far. So I do appreciate it and thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Jones. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, also, I want to congratulate you on the prevention and educational programs that have been successful as the data suggests. Um, I got a call from a retiree, and this question goes to the disposal process. A retiree uh, contacted me and indicated that he had received a document that one of the steps in the disposal process was putting it in the regular trash. So is that part of something we sent out, or what's going on there? And I asked him, to, by the way, to send the document so that you could see exactly what he's referring to. So our, our best practice is really twofold. One is um, 
using the uh, pharmacies or public agencies and they have uh, disposal stations there uh, and you can look that up through the California Board of Pharmacy or you can look at certain websites. And secondly is using the deterra kit as I mentioned here before uh, where you stick the medication into the bag, add the warm water and close it up and it renders the medication uh, inert and, and, and active. Um, so, so, so there are that, other um, things that are published at the CDC as well as California uh, hazardous waste that do mention that you can use other types of disposals, but I think the best or better practice is really using these, uh, these uh, agencies that are at, at our disposal, specifically the pharmacies. So, so it does say put it in trash, but after you take, go through another step, is that what you're saying? The, kit, the, kit the kits, the kits themselves, after they're done, you can stick those uh, into the trash because okay, well they are. Uh, that's the part that perhaps yeah. is missing. Oh, yeah. I see. <laughs> I see. Because he, he was telling me that why, why are we putting this in the trash? Somebody could get it, you know. So I, I will when he when he re provides me with the information, you'll be able to respond to him and tell him what the. Now we are. could tell them that the the kit has soluble activated carbon and okay. makes it inert makes and sense. unretrievable. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Miller. Yeah, uh, thank you, and and um, welcome, Mr. Shinhara. Um, two two kind of questions. One, I wanted to kind of follow on what Ms. Taylor was talking about. One of the things that uh, I've heard from people and seen firsthand is this business of depending on what provider you, you're dealing with, uh, their ability to, to basically re-up those prescriptions it can be very different experience mm -hmm. from provider to provider depending on whether you have a designated primary care physician or not and whether they happen to be there or on the schedule when you or your pharmacy calls to get the approval and then who's covering their file or on call when they're not it can be a real hassle and it can take more than a day and on weekends yeah. it's all up for grabs uh, so that's a concern the other thing that really varies from provider to provider in my experience is their I guess I would call it approach or scope of practice when it comes to pain medicine. And a lot of them, it's not pain medicine, it's just pain management. And the limit of their practice before they will refer you, if you can even get a referral to an actual pain medication and pain medicine practice is yeah, cognitive behavioral therapy, acupressure, acupuncture, yoga, um, happy thoughts and, and <laughs> pharmaceuticals and if you need something beyond that if you have a chronic pain condition that doesn't have any obvious we can see it in a test we can see it on a radiograph we can see it on an MRI if it's based on you know Rome convention syndromes uh, symptoms or something I mean you're you're fighting to get a referral that then is going to cost you bunch of money and so I worry that um, with the focus on opioids which is well placed that we don't again throw the baby out with the bathwater for some of our members who really need these medications that's it's the only thing that's working for them and that we don't throw up barriers and ultimately maybe there's some way we can really identify them and have some kind of different our customized protocols for them but uh, that's my worry there um, the other thing I, I want to go back to this little disposal packet stuff because I I get beat up pretty good by colleagues in the hazardous waste and and, and public health and environmental health community over this issue of CalPERS indicating to people based on the federal requirements that it's okay to put this stuff in the garbage, or worse yet, flush it. Um, or uh, I even wonder whether it's okay for people to treat what's potentially hazardous waste using uh, a methodology that, that doesn't prevent it from leaching out when it gets in a landfill. And so I'm really wondering whether we have talked to um, you know, the state agencies and the, the real advocates in the public health and environmental health community about whether 
this is appropriate solution for California. It certainly seems a step in the right direction versus telling them to put it in the trash or flush it. But, um, you know, we're much more stringent in the state of California. We're kind of ahead of the minimum that's okay in the rest of the country. So I just hope that we'll follow up and make sure that uh, we're heading for really optimum solutions there as well as just this incremental improvement. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you, Mr. Miller. Ms. Brown. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> I'm not sure where um, we learned um, before the kits came around, we were told to dissolve them in a diaper, um, dissolve the medicine in a diaper. You know, don't, don't, throw, don't flush them down the toilet, don't <laughs> put them down the sink. But I'm sure we don't do that methodology anymore. I think the kits are great. Or you can just go drop them off at Kaiser. I mean, that's great. They have a little disposable station there. Um, but I do want to. Um, uh, copy on, uh, follow on to what Ms. Taylor and what Mr. Miller said just about having, you know, access to the drugs. I am someone who had a moderately successful back surgery um, in 2011, but really needed um, uh, pain management. And it's true, but, but back then you got a 30 day supply and um, it was either Percocet or hydrocodone, and then slowly you try to wean off the drug as your, your uh, physical therapy um, uh, increased. And back then you could actually call the pharmacy and they'd call the doctor and your prescription would be refilled. But the federal laws have changed and you cannot do that. And they try not to give you more than a seven day prescription and you've got to be able to get in to see your doctor. They've got to reevaluate you or they're going to send you to a pain management doctor who wants to assess how much pain you're in in order to get um, a refill. And I, I do want to say that what um, CalPERS is doing for their members is, is wonderful. I, it turns out I was only, I was on less than 10 MME a day uh, for my um, chronic back pain. And I was seeing a pain management specialist every 60 days. But after hearing the doctor from Kaiser last July, I, I literally thought, I need to get off this, you know, and it was very little, but still. And so I'm very proud to say it took me several months but I don't uh, take any more, although I am in pain, but I don't have to take any more, and it's, I feel much better, and I appreciate everything we do, but I think it's just educating our members that you can't just call the pharmacist and get a refill, and that if you're on it more than seven days, which is the standard, you're going to have to go back and maybe see either your same doctor or a pain management doctor, because there are these certain time frames that they want you on the, the opioids, and then you need to come come down and take something weaker or you need to go back to your doctor and be reassessed. And so I think it's wonderful what you're doing and I think we're really ultimately saving lives by these programs and I do appreciate you going back and looking at the data to see how many prescriptions, refill prescriptions are being denied and seeing if we can't help those members as well. It's a, it's a balance and the pendulum does swing, right? Over too much, too little and maybe eventually we'll get it just right. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Perez. When I was a uh, young police officer, I was a motorcycle officer, and I wasn't very good. I crashed a lot. So I've, had, uh, <laughs> I've had six back surgeries, and, and what, I, what I learned about opiates is it kind of tricks your brain into saying, hey, you need more. Um, I, I agree with, with what everyone's saying in regards to the balance. Um, uh, Yes, we're going to save life, but the life quality of life of the people you guys are touching with is, is immense. Um, it was the worst part of my life. Worst part of even the surgeries themselves was the, um, the detox. And sometimes we need to give our, as leaders, we need to give our members what they need and not what they want. Uh, so I applaud you for, for making the tough decisions. Thank you. Thank you. Ms. Taylor? Sorry, and I forgot to ask the question, one of the questions I had on page five, which was, as you were going through, you were talking about the number of rescue therapy prescriptions. I don't know. I didn't catch what that was. I'm sorry. It's the um, methadone. Naloxone. Oh, you mean the agents that we use um, for treatment, the methadone, naloxone, buprenorphine? Number of rescue therapies. Yeah, so that's agents, what that is. Met, those so. are agents that we use for uh, uh, in the program. Not all of them are for rescue. Really, naloxone is the drug that we use for uh, rescue medications. 
What's the difference? The I'm difference sorry. to the other two agents, methadone and buprenorphine, really uh, help with some of the chemical imbalances and and uh, and cravings that occur uh, uh, when you withdraw from opioid and you use these other so, agents. Okay, so the number of rescue therapy prescriptions increased by 99 percent. Microphone. Oh, we lost you there. Yeah, so, re so rescue medications are referring to the uh, naloxone portion. Okay, which is the, the re overdose. Right. overdose. The overdose thing. Right, yeah. Okay, okay. I just want, and then the medication assisted treatment is the other stuff. Those are the other agents. Okay, right? that's where I, I didn't understand yeah. that. So that's. And just a clarification the number <clears throat> increasing is a good thing because if someone does have um, an overdose, this is saving lives. Oh, yeah, so absolutely. we are 100% trying to get the word out, and so we want prescribers under the right circumstance if they're going to be on opioids for a period of time after a major surgery that they have that, that um, rescue therapy available for their family um, to be able to give to them if they need it. Right, right. Okay, that's, I just didn't understand what those were. Thank okay. you very much. Thank you. Seeing no other requests, thank you for the presentation. Brings us to agenda item 7B, summary of committee direction. Ms. Bailey Crimmins. Um, first item that I took down was to ensure that the Title II reg change um, addresses any uh, revisions to that section C, so we need to make sure that there is no undue consequences by removing that. The other was to retroactively look at our appeals data, specifically right around the denials, um, and provide the board some information in relation to that based on Ms. Teresa. And then I have a lot of things that I need to get back to individuals about, but those are the two items that I took. Very good, thank you. Item 7C, public comment. I have one request to speak from the public. Ms. Nadine Franklin. Please identify yourself for the record, and you have up to three minutes. Um, okay. Is this on? It's on. Right, okay. Uh, my name is Nadine Franklin. I am a uh, member benefits coordinator with the California School Employees Association and have been in that position for 30 years. Uh, during that period of time, I have worked very closely with the CalPERS staff and I have want to publicly commend them for everything that they have done over those years. Past staff, as well as present, have done so much to educate our members and to educate me so that I could assist our members in um, making sure that they have the retirement that they are entitled to. What is unique about the classified school employees is that more than half of them do not work full time. They do not work eight hours a day. They do not work 12 months of the year. And I learned early on in my career that uh, that has a great impact on their retirement. And if they are not properly reported by their employer, they will receive far less money than they should have received. Um, the um, uh, staff has uh, helped me understand and be able to pass along to our members um, those unique situations, also how they can preserve their benefits if they are leaving their school career early or if they're transitioning into certificated positions. But unfortunately, they don't get that education so often in their schools, so we have determined that it is up to us to help them understand what they need to be looking for and what they need to ask for and questions they need to ask their employers. Um, we have had many, many situations where people have not been reported correctly, and uh, because we are able to find that out, we can then let the CalPERS staff know uh, of those situations, and CalPERS takes it from there and makes sure that it's corrected. We also, I also uh, coordinate our uh, uh, retiree unit, and it is through the retiree unit that we learned that Social Security was shortchanging our members, simply in many cases because they were receiving CalPERS. Um, 
they somehow didn't quite understand the difference between classified employees and teachers who do not contribute to Social Security, but in most cases our classified employees do. In other cases, they had worked in positions where they weren't yet eligible to contribute to CalPERS, and the employers had chosen to have them in alternatives to Social Security. So a portion of what, and then they purchase service credit from CalPERS once they become a CalPERS member. So uh, in some cases, they are uh, legitimately subject to a reduction under windfall elimination or government pension offset, but not on their whole pension. And that was also happening to our members. So with the assistance of CalPERS staff, uh, when we have those situations, which are many, usually one or two a week, at least that we find that have been misreported or uh, have been reduced when they shouldn't have been, uh, CalPERS has always been so responsive and um, has set up special people for us to contact to get these matters taken care of. Um, through the years, we have had uh, pre-retirement seminars for school members only um, so that they could understand those unique situations that uh, impact them and so they could better understand how their retirement works. We have had, uh, I've personally worked with every single one of the uh, managers of the regional offices. They have been extremely responsive, always supplying us with um, uh, speakers for our seminars. And because our seminars have become so large, they've had to send out two people to assist with the questions and so forth at the seminars. Uh, just to give you an example, this year, since October, we have completed 26 seminars. Every one of those are on Saturdays. We arrange for those, and the uh, CalPERS staff gives up their time to come out to our Saturday <coughs> seminars. They are attended from anywhere from 100 to 250, 300 people. And uh, the uh, largest attendance ever was this year in January in Modesto, 510 people came out to our school seminar. So the staff members have, have just been so incredibly responsive, incredibly helpful, and so very much appreciated by myself, my colleague Deb Jackins, who is also working uh, to help uh, educate our members. And we, in fact, have two former committee uh, chair, uh, chairs and the current committee chair in the audience today who have continued to work with our members and uh, help educate them and work closely with the staff. And I just wanted to be sure that the board knows how much they do for us and how how much we appreciate that. So we thank you very much. Thank you. I, I let Ms. Franklin go a little longer on the time. First of all, uh, between her active status and, uh, and the staff side of CSCA, she's been with CSA for 55 years and she's retiring into this month. So this was her chance to come up and say her thanks to the staff. So thank you, Nadine. Thanks for all your hard work. Ms. Norm. Mr. Chair, if I could just take one moment of personal privilege here. Um, I certainly want to also extend our thanks and appreciation to Ms. Nadine Franklin. She has been an extraordinary stakeholder that has really provided a lot of insights and clarity to the customer service teams and the uniqueness of some of the benefits and the education that's been needed by the schools and their members. Um, we have partnered with her and with Ms. Jackins over the last several years, and we've seen a lot of great benefits in terms of the information and the education uh, that the schools are receiving. So Nadine, also on the behalf of the customer service teams here at CalPERS, we want to wish you an, the best in your thank retirement you. and to thank you for the education you've provided to us and the support as well in helping to educate our members. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Jones. Yeah, thank you, uh, Mr. Chair. Uh, Ms. Franklin, I just uh, want to also acknowledge uh, the services just that you- Just a second, Henry. Nadine? 
Henry's talking to you. <laughs> <laughs> I just want to acknowledge your service over the years. Uh, I um, became aware of the name Nadine when I was working for the school district, LA Unified, and I won't say how many years ago that was, <laughs> but uh, the uh, information that she was being was providing then was very helpful and. And after I retired, the retirees, every time I go out to talk to retirees, they always talk about the uh, service that you have provided them and answers the que questions that you've provided answers uh, for them. And they were very appreciative. And I just want to let you know that I also appreciate all the help you provided me. Matter of fact, when I was first elected to this board, one of the first persons I sat down with was Nadine <laughs> to get her thoughts and information that she could provide to help me do my job. So I want to thank you for that, Nadine. Very good. So seeing no other request to speak, we're at the end of our agenda. The open session is now closed. We will be going into closed session in 10 minutes, and I anticipate being able to go to the Finance Committee about 11.15. All right, thank you.